In lecture seven of statistical analysis planning, we're going to go over statistical test selection. In the previous lecture, we looked at the actual theory of hypothesis testing. We're now going to go over various scenarios, research questions, and point out the appropriate tests. Now, we, we will not cover actual any implementation of those tests, and we won't go into too much of the actual discussion of the conclusions, but suffice to say that the significance level and p-value that we discussed in the previous recording, they are very much going to be the at the end of those hypothesis testing, and they're going to decide on the conclusion you make in, re in relation to your research question. The scenarios and guidelines that we're going to go over, they're not all inclusive, but they will help to point you in the right direction. Broadly speaking, we're going to look at two different scenarios here in terms of test selection. Firstly, as shown on the left-hand side image, we're going to consider a single population with a sample, one sample taken from that population. And we're going to ask, we're going to look at, is there a difference association between a sample and a population? And in the graph on the right-hand side, we have the second scenario. That's where we have some population and we've got two or more samples from that population. In this situation, we're also going to look at a difference or association between two or more groups. We'll mainly focus on two groups, but you can also extend that in most cases to more than two. So firstly, we're going to look at some guidelines for one sample test select selection. So this is, you have a population and you take one sample out of that. We're going to use a tree diagram to summarize the various options available to you. And as I mentioned already, this again is only a, a guideline. Okay, it's not going to cover all the various scenarios, but it's going to give you a good idea of the various tests that are available to you. Now, so if we start with our test purpose, we've got two options there to start. We can either go with a goodness of fit, which assesses how well our observed data matches some expected distribution. Or on the other hand, we can go with a population, a population mean test for one sample. This is to assess if the mean of a single sample is statistically different from a known population mean or a population mean that we're claiming in our null hypothesis. So if we go down the left hand side first with our goodness of fit, then we have two more options, the data type. Firstly, we consider we can, can consider numerical data, which we've discussed in the previous uh, recording. So that could be data such as height, weight, or temperature. Or we can go down the right hand side and consist of nominal data, which is names, okay, categories, say color, gender, uh, categories of disease. Now, again, if we go down the left hand side first and consider the numerical part of this, we recall we're on the goodness of fit side here. We're testing to see if our data fits some theoretical distribution. For example, maybe we're, we're interested in checking to see if the data fits a normal distribution. And we recall, hopefully, that the normal distribution has a shape like that. So most of the data is located in the middle, and then you've got these tails that are flatter on either side to represent the fact that the data isn't as, there isn't as much data in the tails. And why we would be interested in seeing if the data is normally distributed or not, or checking to see if it fits the normal distribution is, if it does, there's a lot of nice properties that are available to us if the data is normally just distributed. We have two options here. First of all, if we consider a general fit, let's say we're trying to fit, um, tested the data follows a normal distribution, we have the Kolmogorov Smirov test. And this assesses how well a given sample of data fits a specified distribution, say, for example, the normal distribution. Okay, it provides a method to answer the question how likely is it that we would see a collection of samples like this if it were drawn from the, that particular probability distribution? So an example of this is, let's say you had the question or a study that you want to perform where you want, you're interested in the distribution of say, daily temperatures in a city over a given time. And you want to determine if those expected temperatures follow a normal distribution. Now, on the other hand, we have what's called the Anderson-Darling test. It's similar to the Kolmorov-Smirov test in the sense that it also assesses how well a given sample of data fits a specified distribution, but it extends that particular test 
by placing more weight on the tails of the distribution. So it's more sensitive to, to those tails. For example, an example of distribution where this could occur is say an exponential distribution, something like this. Just draw my plane and you have a distribution that decays as say the X increases. Now, where would this occur in practice? Let's say you're analyzing the lifetime of electronic components for manufacturing, okay? You collect a sample of um, those components, measure their lifetime, let's say you record over a large enough period of time, and you determine if they follow or they fit that exponential distribution, okay? You can imagine the lifetime of products is going to follow this curve here, okay? You'll have components that will last, say, maybe a relatively short period of time. There'll be a lot of them, okay? But as X increases, as lifetime increases, you'll have less components. So you're checking to see if your sample follows that particular distribution. Now, moving back up to nominal data, we can break it down further by the number of categories. Let's say you've got two categories. Consider car color, where you could have red or blue, or you have more than two, let's say a car color again, but blue, red, green, and so on. Now, let's say you've got two categories. Now, let us say you have two categories, then you can use what's called a binomial test. This is only used for categorical data with two outcomes, and it's used to test if the proportion of successes matches some specified proportion. For example, let's say you have a marketing team that launches an advertising campaign targeting two different age groups, say under 30 and over 30. Well, then you can use this binomial test to determine if there's a significant difference in the proportion of individuals who click on their ad online ad campaign between the two age groups. If you have more than two categories, then you can use a chi-square test. And this can be used for two things. It can be used to test if there's an association between the categorical variables or if the observed frequencies matches some expected frequencies. For example, let's say you have a researcher who's performing a survey to assess preferences for different flavors of ice cream. Let's say just three, say chocolate, vanilla, and uh, strawberry. And they're interested in looking at it among participants from different regions, let's say north, south, east, and east and west. So the researcher can use a chi-square test to examine if there's a significant difference in flavor preferences among those various regions. Let's move back to the population mean side. And if you've done any statistics before, these are probably the hypothesis, this hypothesis that you will probably be familiar with. First of all, let's break it up into normally distributed data and norm, not normally distributed. So if your data is normally distributed, we go down along the left-hand side, and then we can perform a one sample t-test, which is used to assess whether the mean of a single sample is statistically different from some hypothesis, hypothesized population mean. So that's the value that you would be complete or claiming in your hy null hypothesis. An example of this is, let's say a researcher wants to determine if the average commute time of, say, employees in a company is significantly different from the national average commute time of 25 minutes. So what they will do is they will collect commute time data from a sample of employees, and they will perform this one sample t-test to see if the sample mean differs significantly from the claimed mean of 25 minutes. So that's for normally distributed data. And to remind you, normally distributed data will look like this. So your symmetric shape. But what happens if you don't have that symmetric shape? It's skewed. So let's say right skewed or left skewed. Then you may not be able to perform a one sample t-test. But what you can do then is you can go down the right hand side here and perform a Wilcoxon test. And that's what it does is it determines if there's a significant difference between the median of the sample and a specified uh, value. Okay, so one sample t-test for the mean, Wilcoxon test for the median. So it doesn't require the data to be normally distributed. Okay, and you could perform a similar test or a similar scenario to the one I mentioned a minute ago with commute times. But in that case, say the data hadn't been uh, symmetric or hadn't been normally distributed. If we have an example of a research question, 
and we want to work out which test is appropriate, let's look at how we could go about doing it. Let's say you have this research question on the top left, which is in relation to checking is there an association between education level and employment status among individuals in the survey. Okay, so the first thing is you start off at your test purpose. There's no mention there of a population mean, and we can see we've got categorical variables, education level and employment status. So we're going to be going down the left hand side here. OK, we get to the data type. Well, it's not numerical. As I've said, it's categorical. OK, so we're going to go down here. And finally, we want to check, is there an association between those two categorical variables? So education level and employment status, are they associated? OK, now there's more than two variables or categories in each here. So we will have to use a chi-square test. So there's an appropriate null hypothesis, an appropriate alternative hypothesis you can set up here. And that's where if you're performing this test, it's a relatively well-known test. You can just look up the kind of how it's set up and then perform the analysis. Here's another example of a research question. Are the average scores of students in a math test significantly different from the national average of 75? So first of all, there is a mention of an average or a mean. So we're definitely going to be going down this direction. OK, then there's the question of is the data normally distributed? Yes or no. We don't know that from the research question. That's going to depend on the data. So once you get your data, you can check if it's normally distributed or not. Let's say it is. If it is, we can then perform a one sample t test. So this is a very quick overview of the kind of tests that are available to you for a one sample. But there's more off the top of my head. And another one you might have seen if you've done any statistics before is you could be doing this for uh, a proportion. So that would be another branch on this tree looking to check or do a hypothesis test in relation to a sample and population and proportion. Now, over the next few slides, I have some quick bullet points summarizing the tests we saw on the last few slides. I'm not going to go into detail here on them. I've already kind of discussed them in the previous slides, but they will be in the slides for your record. So I'm just going to skip over these next few slides and move on to the next scenario. So now we're moving on to two samples. And first of all, we're going to consider the difference between um, groups or samples. So let's start off. Let's say we just have two samples. We look at the more than two shortly. So let's go down the left branch, first of all, there. So the first thing we need to consider is, are we dealing with independent or related samples? If we go down the left branch, we have independent samples. That's where observations in one group are not related to the observations in the other group. In this particular case, we've got six people in the first group and five in the second group. So there isn't a one-to-one -one relationship between those. They're independent of each other. There's no pairing, in other words. For example, you could be comparing test scores of students from in one school to another school. There's no real direct relationship there. On the other hand, if we go down the right hand side of the branch, we can look at related samples or paired samples. They're dependent on, the, on each other. OK, so each individual or observation in one group has someone or something matching to it in the second group. OK, you could be looking at, say, twins. You could have one twin in the first group, second twin in the other group. So they're related. You could have pairs of shoes, left shoe in the one group, right shoe in the other group. So they're dependent, they're related to each other. Moving down through the independent side first, and we get into a similar situation and we'll, as before, and we'll see this again. We first of all have to look at the data type. Is it numerical or is it nominal? Then if it's numerical, same as before, is it normally distributed? Yes or no. So if the data is normally distributed, or we assume it is, we can then perform an independent t-test. Kind of similar idea to what we had for one sample, but now we've got two samples from two populations and we're comparing them to each other. So this assesses if there's a significant difference between the means of two independent groups. OK, for example, let's say you have a researcher who wants to assess if there's a significant difference in exam scores between students who, say, attend traditional lectures and students who went to an online program. OK, researchers going to collect scores from both groups. They're independent. 
and then they're going to compare the means mean exam scores between the two groups to see if they're the same or not. Man Whitney U test is a similar ID, but the main thing here is the data is not normally distributed. So in this case, you can't use the mean. You're instead going to compare the median of the two independent groups. And you could have a similar scenario to the one I just discussed with the researcher looking at traditional lecturing methods and online. You've got two independent groups, but they're you're going to use the median instead of the mean. Now, if the data is nominal, you can use the chi-square test, which we mentioned a few minutes ago. I'll just mention it again here, go over it. So this is used for categorical data with more than two categories. And it's used to test the association between variables are observed versus expected frequencies. For example, let's say you have a supermarket manager who wants to investigate if there's a relationship between say the type of advertisement, say social media, TV, flyers, and customer response to that advertising, positive, negative, or neutral. The manager say could collect data from a survey of 300 customers who are exposed to these type of advertisements and then do the chi-square test to test that association. Now, technically, technically here, we're looking at the difference between groups. So it's an association really that you deal with with a categorical data. Moving back to the, to the dependent samples or related samples, we have the data type, numerical or nominal. Moving down to that, if the data is numerical and it's normally distributed, we have the yes, no case. If it's yes, we can perform what's called a related t-test, similar to an independent t-test, but now the data in both groups is, they're dependent on each other. So this will determine if there's a significant difference between the means of those two related groups. We're assuming they're normally distributed. An example of this, let's say you have a fitness trainer who's evaluating the impact of some exercise program on participants' health or cardiovascular fitness levels. The trainer measures their, say, resting heart rates before and after the program. So you've got your before and after, and they're related because they're obviously it's the same person or same people being measured before and after. And they're going to determine then if there's a significant improvement due to this program or not. The Wilcoxon test, which we've also seen a while ago, similar idea here. You have non-normally distributed data for related um, or dependent samples. But here, the data is not normally distributed. So instead, we consider the median. And that could be the same as the fitness trainer example I just mentioned. But it just happens that our data isn't normally distributed. It could be skewed. And finally, now if we have data that's nominal and related, we can use what's called the McNamara test. This tests if there's a significant difference in proportions between two related groups. For example, let's say if you want to assess if there's a change in students' preference for a teaching method before and after a semester, you could collect data from the same group of students before and after using the teaching method. Then the McNamara test can be used to determine if there's a significant difference in preference between those two time points. Finally, and we won't spend too much time on the more than two situation, but let's say you do have more than two groups. You can use an ANOVA test or an analysis of variance. This determines if there's a significant difference in means among three or more groups, where significance here indicates at least one group mean is significantly different from the others. An example of a research question that could be run with this guideline, let's say you have a new teaching method and you want to see if it leads to a significant improvement in students' T-scores compared to their previous scores. So you've got two samples here, say the before and after this teaching method introduced. So you've got the two and then you come to the independent or related samples. Well, they're related because you have the same group of students before and after this test is or this new teaching method is applied. So we have related data here. It's numerical because it's test scores. And let's assume it's normally distributed. That brings us down to the related t-test. Now, a similar type of situation. We have a research question where it is, are there significant variations in academic performance between students who receive personalized tutoring and those who followed standard classroom instruction. So we've got two students here, or two groups, two samples, 
we have the students with the personalized tutoring and the standard classroom instruction. So two, then these, these are independent groups because there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence between the two groups. You have one group with the personalized teaching or tutoring and those with the standard classroom instruction. So they're not related, they're independent. It's numerical data again, because let's say performance is based on scores. And if we assume that that is normally distributed, that brings us down to the independent t-test. So at, here we could be comparing the average score from one teaching method with the average score from the second teaching method, seeing if they're the same or not. And the final set of guidelines we're going to look at, the final set of guidelines is for association test selection. This is where we've got two or more sets of data and we're interested in seeing if there's association between those data. Let's consider first numerical data. So go down the left branch, then we check is it normally distributed or not. And then if it is normally distributed, we can look at the Pearson correlation coefficient. So now we did encounter this Pearson correlation coefficient a few lecture slides back. This is used to assess if there's a linear relationship between the variables, okay? So assuming it's normally distributed and linearity, we can calculate this correlation coefficient, the sample correlation coefficient, and compare it to a population one that we're assessing. And you recall, hopefully, as shown in the image on the right, correlation coefficient is measured from minus one to plus one, where minus one indicates a perfect negative linear relationship, and plus one indicates a perfect strong positive correlation or a strong positive linear relationship between the two variables and you've everything else in between. And the situation where this could be used is, let's say you have a researcher who's looking at the relationship between study hours and the corresponding exam scores. So you collect the, you ask the students how many hours a week say they spend studying, then you get their grade at the end of the semester and you check to see what that correlation coefficient is. Now, in practice, not all data is going to fit a linear relationship and they may not be normally distributed. Okay, but if that's the case, we can use the Spearman's rank correlation. This is used to assess the strength and direction of a monotonic relationship between two variables. So we haven't countered this before, but monotonic, here are some examples of monotonic and non-monotonic. The first graph there on the left is a monotonic decreasing. So once its data starts decreasing, it continues to do it. It never increases. The next one is a monotonic increasing. Once the data starts going up, it keeps going up and a curve here could be used to explain the relationship between them. Now the last example is non-monotonic because initially it increases, but then it decreases. So monotonic means it's always increasing or always decreasing. So this Spearman's rank correlation can be used to assess the strength and direction of a monotonic relationship between two variables. It doesn't assume linearity or normality in the data. And an example of this could be that researcher example I mentioned a moment ago, just now that data is not linear and not normal. Now, going back to the normal case where you've got categories, you can have, say, a situation with two variables or two categories or more than two. Now, if you've just got the two, you can use chi-square test and a phi test. The chi-square part of that determines if there's an association between the two variables or not, whereas the phi part measures the strength of the association between the variables. For example, let's say you're a manager of some factory and you want to assess whether there is an association between the presence of, say, defects and the manufacturing process. You could have defects, no defects, and then say you've got process A and B. So the chi-square test can be used to determine if there's a relationship or an association between having defects or not and which process you're using. Whereas the phi part or the phi test can be used to test the magnitude of that association if it exists. And if you have more than two categories, say for that example, let's say you had three processes, four processes, you can then use a log linear analysis, which determines if the it determines the presence and strength of association between more than two categorical variables. Finally, for ordinal data, you can also use Spearman's rank correlation, which we mentioned a moment ago. 
This determines if there's a significant monotonic relationship between two ordinal variables. So ordinal variables, as hopefully you recall, is categorical data that has an order to it. Just one example applied to this using this guideline and the research question similar to one I mentioned a minute ago is checking if there's a significant different, a significant linear relationship between students' study hours per week and their final exam scores and statistics scores. So data type there, it's numerical. You've got scores in the exam, number of hours they spend studying. Let's assume it's normally distributed. You calculate then the Pearson correlation coefficient, which measures the strength of that linear relationship between those two variables. So to conclude, I have this image summarizing the whole hypothesis test process. So in each of those sets of guidelines that we covered in this recording, we didn't get into too much detail on the actual nuts and bolts of how you perform the hypothesis test. Suffice to say, first thing you do is you have your research question. You're going to set up your null and alternative hypothesis. You'll perform the appropriate statistical test, which usually means you have your significance level predefined. You'll have a p-value. And that p-value comes from the sample data. You compare the significance level with the p-value and you make your conclusion. And you're usually going to be following one of these branches as shown on the screen. So to conclude, let's go back to summarize our set of indicative steps. You start off with a research question, similar to say the ones we had in this particular lecture slide. Then you have defined the study type that you're going to perform. You collect data using that study. Then you, you scrutinize the data and record the properties of the data. And as hopefully you've seen from this lecture sl uh, slide, the data properties are very important because that's going to tell you which part of the branch you're going to go down. And that's why we spent time on looking at what continuous discrete data meant, whether it was nominal, ordinal, ratio, interval. All that is very important for the guidelines that we had in this lecture. Then you do your data exploration whether it's graphical or numerical methods on one or more variables. And then you pick the appropriate hypothesis test for your analysis. And then you have your conclusion. So that concludes the course. I hope you enjoyed it and hopefully you have picked up something from it. If you have any questions at all, do not hesitate to email me by using vincent.cregan at mtu.ie. I'll speak to you again.